Hello. So today uh, I'm actually talking to Professor Daniel Mroz. Daniel, how are you doing? I'm fine. It's good to see you, Paul. It's been a very, very long time since I've actually recorded a conversation with anyone. I've mainly, for the podcast, I've mainly just been like showing lectures and things like that. But, but we um, need to speak about some important things, don't we? <laughs> extremely, extremely important. Marvel. <laughs> um, yes. um, so you actually, I, I'm going to full disclosure before we go on. Mm -hmm. um, I want to speak to you about the research you're doing for your new book because you've been telling me about it and I want to do a lecture for my undergraduate students and I also want to um, have this podcast episode for them so that it can be something that and I want specifically to ask you today about your research around let's start with energy. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, I guess I have a question going in how um, hmm, how accessible should I keep it? If this is for students, can I get into you know things they might want to look up? Um, well, yeah, I think to... it's, I mean it's not only for students, but I think we okay. should start with because if we start with the obvious thing, like maybe I'll lead you with questions, and if I think okay. that you're going off the deep end, then I'll. Um, I might pull you back. So sure. energy, right? So chi, prana, uh, and the life force, right? The force, the magic, the, the blasts of power that we see in Marvel films. And this concept of energy, where does it come from? I think you've been looking into the origins of some of these types of, 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 of energy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I I think where I'd start is to say that w when we use it as a general term, the word energy, um, it's fine in general contexts, but it becomes inaccurate uh, when we conflate words from other languages and other cultures into a single concept. There's that. And then mm -hmm. also the English word energy, when it's used in this kind of uh, esoteric sense, has its own particular history. And so if we use the English word energy as a general term for things like chi or prana or any number of, uh, of terms from other cultures, religious and medical traditions, it's a little bit like if we're using the word red, when we meant to use the word color. Mm -hmm. Because energy has its own history that is kind of tied in with Western esotericism mm -hmm. and uh, isn't a great translator or general basket or category for all these other terms that in low resolution do admittedly kind of look similar. But part of that similarity is because we've been preloaded by Euro-American ideas to find these things similar. And then also, uh, because as soon as we start to get into a higher resolution, things like uh, qi in uh, Chinese and the Sinosphere cultures and uh, prana and uh, qi, like reiki, these things are quite distinct when you look at them up close. They have different histories, different genealogies, and you know different usage in cultures of native speakers at different times. So right. energy in general uh, becomes a bit of a difficult term to use. So I get that, but um, there's a, and I wonder if I really like, and I really agree with the sense that different cultural contexts at different times, these, these, these different linguistic terms um, have been used and we translate them in English into something like energy. But the, the big question, I think the immediate question from people who um, might be partial to these terms would be, but isn't it the same thing? If we're all humans and if you're meditating in Tibet or doing yoga in India or doing Qigong in China, is it the same thing the energy or is it is it prana is chi is key is is the holy spirit 
I don't know. Is it the same thing? Or, I mean, how, how do you navigate that kind of ontological sort of like scientific or physiological question of, is it the same thing? Um, I've got these little drop down menus appearing in my in my uh, in my mind. Um, yeah. I first of all, uh, I think we need to take a step back and say probably the phenomenological experiences that people are having might overlap substantially. The sorting of those phenomenological experiences into categories that then we have words for is not the same. So I think that would be the, this is very, uh, very uh, magnanimous and decaf answer to your first question. But uh, these are really, uh, you know, quite, they're unpacked in, in really distinct ways at various times. So no, it's not the same thing. <laughs> would be the uh, would be the answer because uh, you've got a whole bunch of like we're constantly bombarded by sensory information. Yeah, and if you learn a particular practice, you're actually taught uh, a, a whole series of parameters with that you use to structure your experience, and those could be like extremely. Um, uh, orderly and presented in a very, very explicit way, or they could be presented as is usually the case when you're studying something like a physical practice. It's usually tacitly, uh, you're initiated to it sort of gradually. Yeah. Um, and if I could give some maybe concrete experiences, like uh, there are no, I'm going to use this terrible term, there are no energy centers. Right. just like that in the body yeah. um they're better described as sort of mind dependent categories or right. mind dependent kinds by which i mean like absolutely there are rocks out there independent of us caring about or looking at the rocks there are no gemstones like mm -hmm. that involves human participation to sort the rocks <laughs> and decide that these ones are valuable and these other ones aren't. Mm -hmm. So similarly, uh, all of these uh, practices that are found in, and they're like kind of historically related, particularly between India and China, but practices that are um, derived from medicine and religion, and those are terms we'd use today, how distinct they were in the past might you know be something we could talk about in more detail hmm. but that uh that terminology is something that is part of a transmitted culture so for sure you can feel sensations of heat weight vibration and flow which is a qigong in chinese the sensations of qigong practice and mm -hmm. like that's a short list. That's four. I've seen people make much longer lists. Um, yeah. And but you know when you do various activities, uh, physical activities, or even intentional uh, visualized activities, you're trying to notice the relationship of those sensations with the particular activities, and then that gets that gets packaged into a particular series of uh, of sensations that are named. So so you're saying kind of so if I'm if if kind of there's a, there's a multiverse and and I decide one of me decides to go to do some qigong and really intensely study qigong and another part of me goes off and studies like kundalini yoga or something like that and I'm learning how to sit and breathe and have a physical relationship with myself and then start to interpret and direct myself to sensations such as whether that be chakras or chi chong points or something like that. These are, this is almost like kind of Judith Butler does, um, this is like gender trouble. This is like Judith Butler does um, the constructedness of these, these categories. So, cause you know, Judith Butler didn't just deconstruct the fact that masculinity and femininity are social constructs. She actually in that 1990 book argued that the very notion of biological sex is already a cultural construct. So that means that if I'm visualizing some sensations here, 
when I'm meditating, that's not actually some kind of spontaneous, naturally, universally occurring thing. That's a very precisely trained and learned cultural construct there. If I'm meditating and I start to see the eye of Horus or something like that, that's already somehow a socially constructed experience. Um, yes. I'm not communing with the divine. And also, um, you've mentioned this, I think you mentioned this in the, the uh, communication we had to set up this uh, this chat. I you keep mentioning the eye of Horus. What's the yeah. eye of Horus? Like from Egyptian mythology? Yeah, yeah, from Egyptian people, mythology. People are seeing the eye of Horus. Yeah, yeah, people are seeing the eye of Horus. So, <laughs> so, so it's, listen, it's uh, so when when I was um, in the lockdowns of 2020, and everyone was sensorily dis deprived. And, and I started to do the Wim Hof method breathing. Um, and that was, it, and the cold exposure stuff. And it was, it was quite good. And I joined Facebook groups and because when you, when you do in the breathing and it gets quite meditative and it gets quite deep and you start to see, you can see light shows and you can see all, there's like firework displays. It's like the Northern lights and stuff behind your, your eyelids. And it's not uncommon for people to see the the eye of Horus, you know, the, the the Greek mythological sign that looks like an eye that some people get tattooed. Um, and so then people think that they're communing with the divine or the universe at that point, because these mythological symbols must relate to some universal cosmological constant or something like that. So yeah, I keep I keep referring to that because in that was the last kind of um sort of meditative practice that I was involved in um and it was a very very common thing for people to discuss in these Facebook groups um and if you read the sort of Wim Hof literature as well they kind of go oh yeah you may well see these things and you may have like um out of body experiences and stuff like that as well so that's why I, that's what I keep coming back to um, yeah, and also yeah, yeah. because at a certain point, probably because of reading a lot of these Facebook posts, when I was doing this stuff, I was thinking, can I see the eye of Horus? <laughs> Am I visualizing that? So, in fact, this is a really humorous example, but it's ex that is exactly the kind of tacit uh, in-group in training that I'm talking about when yeah. I suggest that if you start to participate in a group, you're having all, like if you look at the phosphines behind your eyes, when you close your eyes and the shapes that they make, you know, you can stare at that for a really long time. It's extremely interesting. It's, yeah. you know, self-generated abstract painting. It's far fabulous. You can also easily start to unpack that or interpret it based on a particular programming that you've received very, very tacitly. I would kind of nuance my yup answer to the uh, Judith Butler question a little bit. There's this great uh, Chinese, I guess we could say it's a, it's an idiom or aphorism. And uh, it comes from a meditation text called the uh, Jade Emperor's Mind Seal Classic. Right. Which sounds like sounds like a golf tournament because it's been badly translated. But <laughs> people would uh, would be able to find that. And uh, the, the phrase uh, is uh, "ruo wang ruo tsun," which literally means like both alive and dead. And the kind of idiomatic interpretation of that is eh, sometimes you remember, sometimes you forget. So you can have things be real in your experience, and then later point in your life you determine like oh that's probably not real <laughs> and then even later you're like oh yeah it was totally real i would you know so the um the likelihood of things containing their opposites is really high and it's a good idea to take that on without too much um anxiety okay and so i think i would say that like the resemblance particularly between things done in india and things done in china um is you know on one level maybe a low resolution level that's pretty reasonable on the other hand as you get up close to it you can see that things have like been going on for a thousand years and interpretations have really really branched and forked and we have 
uh, the um, basic views with which certain types of practices were undertaken are also quite distinct. And so you could argue it, or you could not even argue it. That's not the right term. You can experience it both ways. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty funny to experience the critical uh, <laughs> list, like all these instances of, you know, demented 19th century and 20th century interpretations of Asian practices that we find in Euro-American culture. That list is very, very entertaining because it's so far departs from what was actually going on. And so I think I, I maybe make a triangle. There's a low resolution view that certain things that are historically linked are quite similar. Mm -hmm. And they are derived from human embodiment and like the broadest features of human embodiment. Most people, when they close their eyes, see phosphenes. Not everybody, but most people. Um, there's the, uh, I don't know, kind of anthropologically strict relativist point of view where every single cultural expression is distinct and, you know, we should try and keep that very, very separate mm -hmm. in order to understand it properly and, you know, not project things on top of it that have no place there. And then I think linked to that is the instance where that term in English energy has since the 19th century, kind of since the 17th, and I can get into the list, but certainly since the 19th, has absolutely been projected into places where it uh, is replacing, shall we say, indigenous information. Okay. So there's kind of three, three poles there. There's a parochial Euro-American situation of energy being Use as a general term where perhaps it's not the best general term. There's the uh, situation that all these particular things like qi and even, you know, where it's the same um, Chinese origin logogram is being used in Japanese, qi, those two things are not necessarily the same. Mm. And that's my, our being anthropologically strict over here. And then I suppose there's low resolution. Yeah, we've got all of these uh, experiences of you know circles and lines, and using the kind of hydraulic metaphors uh, to correlate and interpret all of the, uh, the sensory input we get when we uh, when we practice things. Yeah. So when you say low resolution, and that's the perspective that would enable you to go, yeah, energy, it's all the same. And is that another way of talking about um, sort of kind of uh, Christian universalism? So there's a kind of a Christian tendency to kind of absorb all difference into there's only one true God and it's all the same. Um, and this kind of like, Protestant notion of of what religion is and then that's projected elsewhere around the world and Europeans kind of go this is just an inferior version of you know mm -hmm. the, the the one true God kind of thing is so low resolution is that symptomatic of something that happened in European thought or something that's characteristic of a European tendency to universalize or is it not um I think that's a, a fair general description. Um, I do think we could maybe say that if it's possible for one to encounter, I don't know, you go to your, you know, Kung Fu class and you go to your, you know, Qi Gong class and uh, you meet you meet Qi and then you go to your yoga class and you meet Prana, um, you might if it's possible to have those experiences innocently, uh, you could correlate that, and that would be a kind of innocent version of the uh, of this low resolution view. As we look at how these things have influenced cultural and intellectual history, then I think what you've just mentioned comes to the fore, where you know there's a whole movement. Uh, the successful ones were Descartes and Newton, and the unsuccessful one was uh, sort of trying to ride on their coattails. 
uh, someone named Franz Mesmer. So mm. Mesmer posited this uh, magnetic fluid, um, yeah. Lebensmagnetismus, I think was the term he used for it. Right. And this was a kind of laying on of hands uh, or even just making sort of magical passes in the air, healing that uh, that you know ran amok in Europe. And uh, I think people just started having too much fun. And uh, so when was Mesmer? So Mesmer was seventeenth like, century, seventeen hundreds, and this was so not sixteen hundred, seventeen. This was manipulating what. Was this um, laying on of hands, or was this what was? Yeah, it? There, there, there were even these wonderful machines where, like you know, the, the the person who was performing the quote energy healing would hold one part of the machine, and then a whole bunch of people could hold other parts of this uh, metal structure and, and okay. get the vibes. Um, the uh, so yeah, there was this magnetic fluid, animal magnetism. This just and, I've just had this horrible flashback to. Mm -hmm. When I was a teenager, right, and my dad was always trying to find ways of of getting out of his actual job and just he was just earning some money, and he started to try and sell these bracelets that had a magnet on them, and they were called bioflows or eco no bioflows, and it was something about it was this like it's like something kind of magnetism and your blood or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, that he honestly believed that it was making him better or i don't know is that yeah. related to that um i imagine if we really dug that's probably yes. going to be uh going to be linked all the way back to that a, a nice anecdote about that uh about um mesmer is the french government was sort of horrified by the social chaos being created by uh essentially people having an opportunity to you know free their ids and you know go into these light trances and yeah. i imagine they were just having you know lots of far too obvious um un socially unsanctioned sex and so the french government actually created a committee to debunk this and they brought in the american um sort of polymath benjamin franklin who as you'll recall was studying lightning and electricity and you know flying kites in thunderstorms to see what would happen and so they brought in ben franklin to debunk uh mesmerism and um the debunking was in many ways kind of uh kind of successful this was you know started to be uh uh less socially present but then um helena petrovna blavatskaya you know madame blavatsky mm -hmm. got a hold of this and uh, by getting a hold of it, I mean, you know, read accounts of it. And, uh, you know, she was a, a, an ingenious um, marketer of the exotic. And so she sort of invented her own version of a South Asian cosmology and mixed that with whatever synthesis of Western esotericism she was uh, using to sell her her services as a medium yeah. and uh, mesmerism got added into that mix. So much of what was then um, taken on as, you know, English language representations of South Asian religious and medical practices got filtered through that. Mm. So where uh and to track back uh words i mentioned descartes and newton and there was a, a kind of dissatisfaction in the i guess that's the 1600s uh with um the idea of action at a distance because of inherent nature <clears throat> So like the black bile in my God knows what is related to the planet Saturn. And those right. two things are just, they're the same. And so they can act at a distance. It's not problematic. And that comes from earlier hermetic thought. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Marcellus Ficino or Ficino. And a synthesis of, you know, Greek and Latin ideas that he put together in the uh, in the renaissance so that started to be seen as like well, you know 
there's space between things. How do things affect each other at mm -hmm. over distance? And so uh, Newton, who is, you know, we associate it with this kind of materialist worldview, like he was a theologian and an alchemist. And um, I think his name for gravity was the occult force. Mm -hmm. So his theory of gravity was action at a distance with no, you know, there was no, uh, there's no obvious reason for it, for it happening. And yet there it is. So Descartes decides that there's, you know, a mental substance and a physical substance and tries to account for what can be seen and what can't be seen, I guess. And so Mesmer tried to, you know, ride this uh, very successful early scientific current that was still very much attached to religion, mm -hmm. in this case, to, Chris to Christianity in Europe. And, uh, propose his magnetic fluid and then you know sort of the next stop along the road um is uh is helena blavatsky blavatsky then and the you once said to me you know in a message or an email you're like never underestimate the influence of madame blavatsky it's like the so so the tell us about so people don't know, like, let's imagine my students don't know about Theosophy and Blavatsky. I mean, how would you sum that up? And the, and the influence it had on thinking about energies, I guess, or tra mistranslating the ideas of, or inventing translations of ideas of Eastern mysticism, say, or, or spiritual powers or something. What kind of effect? Yeah, and this was a, uh... Madame Blavatsky and uh, her collaborators created a, you know, extremely successful international um, organization for, I, I, you know, today we, we have so much marketing and so many things that are... <clears throat> oh, I think that might be... Quite obviously designed to distract uh, money. Ooh, did I freeze there? Uh, I think um, my internet connection is unstable, oh, it says, but we'll see. We'll see. It does that sometimes, mm -hmm. just to keep me on my toes. Phased uh, in and I... out. So, you know, in the, the, the most, uh, the, the kindliest of lights, you know, where the Theosophical Society was a, uh, you know, a wonderful social activity that published all kinds of pamphlets and published all kinds of books and people exchange ideas and you know this i believe this began in new york city and it actually moved to uh adiar in uh in south india on the um the east coast of india and uh it's near chennai and uh in madras and you know of course people were able to purchase buildings and create infrastructure and hold meetings and there was a real uh kind of, uh, I guess, a Victorianization of all of this earlier esoteric European material, and uh, at the same time, the birth of, uh, of what uh, is referred to as Hindu modernism, which is uh, part of the kind of, I guess, Protestantism inventing the idea that other people have religions and that there's there are world religions and we should study them and they're in some way comparable. Um, <clears throat> all of that is taking place and uh, there's a celebrated uh, 19th century author on, on, on yoga and meditation, uh, Swami Vivekananda, who is sort of trying to uh, present a compelling vision that you know all of these ancient uh, South Asian th uh, ideas and practices texts have you know equivalence to the obvious domination that uh, Christianity has achieved during the colonial period and so of course a lot of this gets transformed and you know I, I we can create lists of uh, of readings that will kind of support the extremely uh, quick and dirty version of this that I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. But um, 
the presentation of uh, of yoga that we have uh, received today of hatha yoga of the exercise systems uh, was kind of invented at that time mm -hmm. and the sort of interesting feedback loop is we have the, the theosophical society that is uh, creating a, it's got a kind of uh, perennial perennialist vision or what uh, would technically be called a religionist vision I think all of these traditions teachings like you know, every path is different but it all leads to the top of the, the same mountain where the view is the same so this is a, a very uh, common idea that emerges I think from kind of the, the colonial period and the, the domination of, of Christianity and turns into various uh amateur intellectual movements in the uh, early 20th century, and then into actual religious studies with uh, Mircea Eliade, the Romanian uh, scholar of religion, who really, that was his view, the phenomenology of religion. And uh, it came out of the Aranos Institute, uh, Carl Jung, all of the, these uh, efforts to look at other cultures, but with the idea that there was some kind of fundamental uh, truth behind what we talked about before, like the fact that people are going to have similar phenomenological experiences because they do have, to important degrees, similar kinds of embodiment. Mm -hmm. So there's a really interesting mix of the popular or uh, amateur intellectual mm -hmm. and the what we would consider to be more academically reputable and perhaps more research that appears uh in the late 19th and early 20th century and you know i don't know if your students had this experience but like you may have this too like you read something like nietzsche and you're like that would never get published today <laughs> you know <laughs> like uh, our parameters for what we consider uh, serious thinking and how that's expressed uh really have shifted a lot and so a lot of this material um again has also has also shifted quite substantially and there was a kind of self-help movement in the united states in the late 19th century called the, the new thought movement which had emerged from um christian science you know, the christian science reading room where yeah. oh He's frozen. Publish a, a newsletter. So that kind of Protestant fundamentalist mysticism, which is the three words that don't usually go together, mm -hmm. uh, was really influential on Hindu modernism. And so the the appetite of uh, um, you know upper middle class uh, Indians in the uh, South Asians in India during the uh, the imperial period was for Western ideas, which was really high. And then there was this, uh, you know, all these attempts at synthesis hmm. and they produced um, these interesting uh, interpretations. The one that's two that are really uh, kind of significant for talking about energy, um, Jung gave these lectures in I think 1932, uh, the psychology of Kundalini Yoga, mm. and where he took a uh, really difficult to read translation of one chapter of um, of, of, a, of a, a tantric text that had been done by a, a British uh, British colonial judge who wrote under the pen name of Arthur Avalon. Right. And so this called, I think it's called the, the Serpent Power. Um, I have one just over yeah. there, but I won't get it. Anyway, um, so that text was kind of Jung's playground for bringing forward all kinds of notions that are really, uh, you know, more platonic and a little bit more of his own invention than what that that instructional manual for uh, practicing particular tantras uh, said. And the big ones, I suppose, like the, the by platonic, I mean correlating things like, oh, we do thinking in our heads, we do 
feeling in our hearts and we uh, feel our appetites in our pelvis and our abdomen, like for sure. But you could also say, you know, I'm feeling my appetites in my head. Uh, you know, it's it's not quite uh, this, and uh, it's not as arbitrary or as given as all that. Or the decision of where we feel things can be pretty arbitrary, uh, because our our phenomenology is extremely varied. And so Jung maps this kind of uh, platonic vision of where feelings are located somatically onto the chakras, which now gets written chakras in uh, in English. And that is not actually found in the text he was interpreting or pretty much anywhere. <laughs> uh, and this led to the, the idea that uh, we're discovering something real in meditation, as opposed to following a fairly constructed and artificial Pro program like people mm -hmm. don't have chakras, they build them because mm -hmm. they've spent time imagining that that's there. Um, another very good example of this slippage between discovering the real or uh, being introduced to uh, a particular practice is uh, the Evans Wentz's translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So it's presented in translation as a thanatology, meaning like this is what. Tibetan Buddhists believe happens to you as you die. And in fact, it's a practice. You spend your whole life imagining these phases as you die so that when you're actually dying, you can do your practice and confirm the view that is being taught in that particular tradition. So something that was a how-to manual got interpreted as a, oh, this is uh, you know, a description of, of reality and granted it's done in a very unusual cultural way, but it's just, it's an attempting, it's an attempt to describe rocks and not gemstones. And in fact, all of these things are categorizations of somatic information rather than, uh, attempts to deal with what in Euro American culture we prioritize, which would be like the real world of material objects. Mm. God, did I talk for a long time there? No, that was, was that was good. I hope, I hope that was not That's, too messy. No, um, no, that, that I like I like that. Well punctuated and, I mean, I guess quite truncated and 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 simplified, but but really interesting because, um, I'm just I mean I think there's some really interesting stuff there about um, well about about the the constructedness of of this rather than the essentialism that the other thing that I wanted to ask you about which is connected to all of this is you sent me a draft of a chapter that you're working on for your book and that the section that you sent me you provisionally titled it um, source amnesia and you sent it to me because I was thinking and writing about certain types of kind of bullshit marketing spirituality you know commodified spirituality and you kind of I think that one aspect of your argument is that in the west there is a or, or in the modern world there's a tendency to suffer from source amnesia either deliberately or not so that the person who sells you the spiritual practice is it's either a, a, an expression of a universal tradition that you don't dignify with a history because maybe you've just discovered it spontaneously, but actually you, you're communing with the ancients. And it's, it's another form of universalizing. I mean, tell us a little bit about why you're interested in source amnesia. Do you think that it's a thing now or was it a thing with the theosophists or was it a thing like what's the effect of it? How much are we living I, in a time of source amnesia? Um, I suspect that source amnesia is constant. And, you know, we, you and I have likely done it ourselves. Um, there were two terms that I thought were very, very helpful to consider uh, the, the, what I would broadly put as, you know, misrepresentations of, uh, of, Asian physical, religious, medical practices in the West. And those would be source amnesia, which is from a scholar named Olav Hammer. 
uh, is, I believe he's Dutch and he's a religious studies scholar. And then this idea of religionism, which comes from uh, Wouter Hanegraaff, who is a, also a Dutch scholar of religion. Um, and we, one led me to the other, I'm not sure in what order I, uh, I got those, those, two, uh, those two terms. So source amnesia, um, I'll actually read it. Okay. Uh, this is from a, a 2004 book by Olaf Hammer. And so he describes this in the case of religious bricolage, source amnesia typically takes place when a general term used in connection with an older tradition becomes associated with specific modern reinterpretations. With time, a chain of transmission is built up in which the latest spokespersons may have a horizon in time that stretches no more than 20 or 30 years back and in which anything older than this is considered to belong to a diffuse and ancient past. The question whether one's preferred doctrines are truly the result of ancient traditions or were remade a few years ago by some creative religious entrepreneur becomes irrelevant. The latest innovation in the ageless tradition is perceived to be essentially the same. The latest innovation and the ageless tradition are perceived to essentially be the same. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think, happens both for uh, reasons nefarious and profit-seeking and also uh, for reasons quite innocent. And uh, because of ongoing research, things can shift. To give a very con uh, you know, concrete example of this, um, there's a very short and terse text uh, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, and that is really quite old. Mm -hmm. And that is, it describes something, but it's extremely terse and vague, and it doesn't just doesn't seem to describe Hatha Yoga in the sense that it uh, there are no postures in it, and it does use the the term yoga, and that has been presented uh, by. Hindu modernism as the, uh, the source, like the ur text for the practice of hatha yoga that is, you know, widely diffused around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a wonderful researcher named James Mallinson who has determined, at least for now, that the actual source text for hatha yoga is this uh, thing called the Amrita Siddhi, and it is about a thousand years old, I think it's from the 11th century, 10th century. And it was what we would, the Buddhism, the Vajrayana Buddhism that you've always preserved in, in Tibet, Nepal, and in the Himalayas, but as, as practiced in India as it was at the time. And so you've got something that has a horizon in time that was speculated to be about two or even, you know, 3,000 years, 2,500 years old, and suddenly it's only a thousand years old. And the purpose and uh, practice uh, also has shifted many times over time. And research is wonderful because now we can see like, oh, this thing, you know, it, it meant this at this phase. I mean, people were using the word yoga a long, long time ago uh, before the common era. So it meant that. And in 1100, it meant this. And in the 19th century, it meant something else. And so when we don't have source amnesia, maybe it challenges our authenticity because you know, you're know you aware of how many times the thing you do has changed. Um, at the same time, it, you're, you're better informed as to the history or the possible history, because as we continue to to research things and read old documents and you know correlate you know, kind of philological mm. work with anthropological work. We just learn more. And do, do you think that kind of people want that or, or source amnesia is comforting because it means that you are communing with the divine or the constant or the universe or the rather than we're just doing some stuff that is different to the stuff that they did before. Um, because that somehow makes it too arbitrary or, you know, do people want that anchor 
in something that they feel is is a, a constant is it i mean i guess this connects with religionism as well i suppose mm -hmm. you know like you you want you you want your meditation to be something that is not just made up and not just mm -hmm. you know imagining things that someone told you to imagine but actually a kind of royal road to you know merging with the universe or preparing you for merging with the universe is, is that the kind of thing do you think is that the desire that kind of desire for a hotline to <laughs> insight into the universe it all feels like a marvel film now at this point <laughs> yeah i i think people's desire for authenticity also shifts around i'm i'm sorry i'm giving you these really slippery answers but you know i think the desire of for authenticity that one might have experienced uh practicing whatever was being presented as 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 yoga in the 19th late 19th century and doing it now like was, our desire for authenticity is not going to be the same but for sure there's a desire for authenticity and you know the people especially the uh the south asian participants in the philosophical society in the 19th century uh also had some sort of desire for authenticity that's probably pretty distinct from the one we have now generally speaking people want some sort of authentic experience. I think the same, uh, similar, uh, it's not a miasma, that's too strong a word, an atmosphere that we often discover in uh, the discussions around martial arts, in, in within a group discussing people two or three generations ago, and they're all incredibly badass. Mm. Right. And consequently, what we are doing has not necessarily, you know, we don't maybe confront the same situations of violence, but it hasn't been diluted because, you know, somebody at the top of the food chain was particularly badass. So that's an appetite for authenticity right there as well. Yeah. And uh, so I think that atmosphere, which you may experience as a miasma or not, it certainly appears. And then the other bit uh, where I was saying religionism, and again, this is also really worth uh, worth quoting because it's so clear. It's a little bit more, um, you know, he uses terms that might be we might need to look up. But um, so this is Water Hanegraaff describing religionism, which sort of goes in part uh, with uh, source amnesia. In the modern science of religion, the study of historical currents in search of an inner in quotes, universal dimension is technically known as religionism. This agenda has strongly influenced the way in which religion has been studied after World War II, especially in the United States, under the influence of Mircea Eliade and his school. Religionism makes the mistake of ignoring religious diversity, historical change, and any question of external influences, because all it cares about is an experiential dimension that transcends history and will always remain inaccessible to scholarly research by definition. And that is a that is a very Dutch take no prisoners kind of way of putting it. Um, I do feel like because you know, the research I've done with with our group with martial arts studies, I'm also between cultural history and phenomenology, and so that that quote I just read is really uh, it, it, it it is not taking any phenomenology, no, sir. But nevertheless, uh, it does describe uh, this idea. Uh, Marseille Eliade wrote a book, uh, Yoga, Immortality, and Freedom. I think it was published in the 50s, maybe the 40s. And in that book, the noun yoga is unproblematically considered to refer to one thing that occurs, you know, when the Vedas are being written, and in the colonial period, and there's no discussion of change. I'm being a little bit um, overly emphatic because there's really a lot of interesting material in the book. But it is, there's an assumption that this this phenomenon has been uh, consistent, mm. and mm -hmm. yeah, and I think there's. I was. I don't know if your students care about this, but this was a, a funny joke that. Um, Six Fetzler and I were chatting about this because Six uh, Six Fetzler is a scholar involved in martial arts studies, and he's also a PhD in religious studies. 
under uh, extremely reputed, reputed uh, German scholar of religious studies, who's uh, Berkhard Gladigov. And Berkhard Gladigov used to talk about like the electric, the electrification of religious studies, okay. where in the mid 20th century, apparently, like all of these phenomena that had nothing to do with Christianity were described using energetic models. Okay. And uh, why did I mention this thing about say, oh, there's another joke where I just figured like, if you, most of your work doesn't involve field, this is why I'm a little bit partial to phenomenology. If you don't do any field work you, as a researcher, your experience is like where I am right now. I'm sitting in my chair, I'm gonna read a book. And no matter what the book is, my daily experience uh, is the same. The content of the book is different, but I sit in my chair. So it's very easy to start to imagine that I've had exactly the same experience of going to the library, making my coffee, sitting down, cracking open my book, and oh, I'm Altaic shamanism. And then, you know, the next day, cracking up my book, oh, stuff, you know, in South India. And equating that because you've had exactly the same phenomenological experience. So a lot of the, uh, you know, religious studies uh, that was done in the mid 20th century, uh, I feel, did not benefit from enough field work and that has really changed i like the i, I think that's it that is incredible that was a little that also was a bit mean what i just did there because like oh. yeah no sit there read books it's good but it's still <laughs> no i guess it's another it's it, it's it's the kind of um degree zero or ground zero of of making category mistakes where you can pick up a book about qigong and a book about yoga and you've never been you know you know you've never done them um and you go oh, well that that must be the same the same thing then and it it could we could be looking at different traditions that are thousands of or hundreds of years apart in completely different political and ideological circumstances with completely different cosmologies uh, and you think that oh that's the same but i like the idea of the electrification of 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 religion or religious studies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have it in German because Sixth wrote it in German. It's this wonderful, wonderful uh, idiom or catchphrase. Something that occurred to me that has now just left my head, and I hope oh. I'll get it back when we, you were discussing it. Oh, yeah. The idea that um, anytime, like the, the appetite for authenticity is perhaps that you want to participate in something that is established. And particularly like Qigong, like Qigong is in flux and recent yeah. and has never not been in flux. And one can read David Palmer's book mm -hmm. and, and, you know, survey the development of it, you know, just as it's marketed in, in uh, yeah. Euro-American contexts, yoga is similar. So if you are cool with participating with in activities that are in a constant state of becoming yeah it's all right however our appetite for authenticity is like oh, i just want like one thing i want to find something that is really a gemstone not just that they attributed a gemstone to this yeah. to it i want a real gemstone which is a you know a pork daiquiri like you can't have a real gemstone yeah. uh, the the conflation of mind independent categories and mind dependent categories is pretty uh it's always operative and I'm, I'm sure you like you know roll on roll soon you're going to catch yourself doing it mm. you know even with the best of intentions i the reason it's taking me so long to write the chapter that you know we're all of our chatting has been about yeah. is because I constantly catch myself in these loops of oh that's an assumption oh, no I did it again like it's well, very uh I'm going to um, simplify it for you soon enough because what, Thanks. I told, I've told you what I'm going to do. I've told you because it's only the draft chapter or a section of it. And I read it and loved it. And um, I said, I'm going to pull out all of these quotes and I'm going to put them onto a PowerPoint. And this is going to be my lecture. <laughs> and I'm going to acknowledge you as the, as the source and it's unpublished and it's forthcoming and all the rest of it. But then, but I'm, I'll record the lecture and send you the link. <laughs> yeah, you'll be like, no, don't simplify uh, it even more. You, um, you know, to give, I, I kind of, I'm chuffed about this. So I, I talked about Jung and his uh, his presentation of uh, this, the, you know, the the psychology of Kundalini Yoga, which has 
you know, been reappropriated like anonymously and comprehensively. And now, you know, if you're not really, really reading some incredibly uh, hard to access because it's in the university library or, you know, behind a JSTOR paywall, if you're reading about those subjects, chances are you're reading, um, you're reading Jung's take. Yeah. So a similar, and this is, this is the, I'm going to do one of my scandalous claims, uh, the softer of my two scandalous claims. This one kind of freaks people out. So the gentleman who invented, um, or is it, to whom the, the invention of American method acting is attributed is a, a, a Russian, uh, upper, upper, upper middle-class guy named Konstantin Stanislavsky, who was obsessed with the circus as a young person and theater as a, as a slightly older person and dedicated his family fortune to the creation of the Moscow Art Theater and to a method of training actors that uh, was really reliable and modern and scientific. This is the late 19th century, early 20th century. And in uh, he had a, an associate uh, named uh, Nikolai Demidov and who so these these were very interested, curious, uh, cosmopolitan people who had a lot of time and leisure, and so they were constantly reading. And Demidov gave Stanislavski these translations that were made in 1911 of books about yoga. And you know, I, this is in all the sort of theater studies literature, and that's you know literature I encounter all the time because of my job and. Wow, 1911, that's pretty early. And so I started scratching a little bit. And of course, the books were by someone named Yogi Ramacharaka. And this is just uh, an intuition because I, I lived in South India for a while, but not long enough to really get good language skills. Uh, I lived in Kerala, they speak Malayalam. But uh, like Sanskrit has a lot of A's in it as a language. And they're, they're kind of pronounced more like uh. A lot of them, but there's different kinds of A's. And I just thought Rama Charaka, Charaka, like there's too many A's in that. That can't be real. So I started checking it out. And of course, it was uh, William Walker Atkinson from Baltimore uh, who had three South Asian sound sounding pen names. He was a yogi and two swamis. And he uh, was part of the, he was part of the Theosophical Society. And he wrote sort of new thought, improve yourself pamphlets and mm -hmm. marketed them. That was his, that was his, his gig. And that got translated into Russian and wound up uh, being influencing Stanislavski. And uh, there was a movement in the States in the 1990s, uh, sort of like, let's make Stanislavski great again. And uh, Stanislavski mentions in his writings, uh, you know, I have, I have read the, read about the prana of the Hindus. Like it's, it's really, really, uh, 19th century language and but of course what he's read about is this kind of new thought invention of um of william walker atkinson and it a lot of theater studies scholars just kind of went oh yeah it's yoga stanislavski the asian influence on stanislavski yeah. and <laughs> meanwhile meanwhile if you just jump over to religious studies like an awful lot has been done on you know the kind of insertion of uh atkinson into uh into yoga in the late 19th and early 20th century and some fascinating things basically vivekananda wrote three books about 10 years later um yogi ramacharaka writes three books taking you know word for word copies so atkinson is, is cribbing uh you know, plagiarizing uh, uh vivekananda and of course it's being sold as sort of self-help pamphlets and it's got a very protestant language like the tasks of the yogi the work of the yogi on himself and there's no sanskrit there's no mention of asanas it's very very lean and there's a lot of feeling of atmospheres you know, radiating out feeling in um nature practices that were very popular at the turn of the century like you know going out under the sun all nude um these kinds of uh, these kinds of things, and apparently it also got to Japan, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, so Reiki, which involves the laying on of hands and the projection of uh, of, of, of energy, um, projection of key for healing purposes, apparently a major source of Reiki was also uh, the writings of William Walker Atkinson because he writes about how this prana can be projected. And there are like, you know, slightly more um, older traditions of reijutsu in, in Japan of, of um, laying on of hands type healing. So it, he's not totally responsible for it, but this guy from Baltimore winds up influencing, um, you know, 20th century European art theater and um, and uh, something that's identified very strongly as a as a as a Japanese cultural practice. So that I think is 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 quite quite wonderful and what this is a little bit of just my own stuff but the uh well you know if you look at the the context in which Konstantin Stanislavski lived it's a Russian Orthodox context and he uses all of these very particular phrases and they've been translated into English but uh, you know the work of the actor on themselves and that was the, the actual title of his his uh, his first book, I think, Robotica, like work. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to know from all my Russian theater scholar study theater studies scholar friends, like, is there a phrase in the Russian of that time that might be derived from uh, from Russian Orthodox Christianity that is this work on the self because mm-hmm. a lot of you know like strictly speaking religions try and like detach you from your ideas of yourself a lot of them <laughs> they want to make a very low resolution claim there yeah. uh the self is to be de-emphasized so what's this work on the self and uh you know i asked around asked around asked around and then eventually i had a russian uh graduate student who was auditing my course online and she teaches at the gitis which is the moscow art theater in moscow like she's teaching in Stanis- the institution Stanislavski founded and she said oh yeah there's this book by a Russian scholar that's all about Stanislavski and yoga you've got to check it out and very fortunately it had been translated by a publishing house that's dedicated to bringing things from that were in, not in English into English mm. and uh, Icarus publications and in it there's a table and you've got Yogi Ramacharaka, the work of the yogi on himself, the tasks of the yogi, and Stanislavski, the work of the actor on himself, and the tasks of the actor. And I thought this was amazing because it's like Protestant, you know, grifty Protestant mysticism is has worked its way into a very uh, a discussion around acting that's taken still to this day extremely, extremely seriously. And in fact, that book, Stanislavski and Yoga, just accepts that Atkinson was uh, was talking about yoga as practiced in South Asia, which I, I think is preposterous. Uh, but it's super, super interesting. So like my critical perspective was like, oh God, please just read some religious studies. It's right there. And then my creative side is like, wow, that's amazing. Like these syntheses are, are simply extraordinary because they bring together parts of the world that we had no idea were in contact with each other yeah no i, th- I think there's there's so many of these i'm gonna we're gonna have to wrap up soon because i don't want this to go on for more for more than an hour really. i think an hour is i'm not we're no joe Rogan here. we're not doing long form kind of um, oh, right. well yeah I, I, rambling I, yeah. stone I, musings um, need, need a bottle of wine if we're doing it. Well, like, you know what? Rogan. It's, it's 5 p.m. and it's Friday. Okay. So, you know, we're okay. not really far away from that. I know you're I, a few I'm, hours. I'm before. afraid it's only noon. <laughs> but yeah, no, this is um, it, it, these, these strange circuits that seem to be east west encounters they're actually just like west west internal dialogues, <laughs> like based on a fantasy of, of, an, of an eastern other. Like Gaia hypothesis and all of these different kind of hippie kind of new age or alternative or countercultural theories that is kind of devised somewhere in like probably California or or wherever. But I'm I'm going to wrap it up 
Daniel, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to say thank you. And, yeah, and we haven't we haven't covered as much stuff as as we wanted to, but um, well, you can save the uh, you know all of the uh, the treasures for your for your lecture. You know? Oh yes. Uh, well, I might what I might do is um, I'm gonna pod I'll podcast this um in time for the students to be able to watch this before or listen to this before the lecture, and then I'll I'll record the lecture. And it'll be another circuit. This will be like, and then you can you can watch what I say about your findings and your arguments, and you can go, oh my god, that's that's so very wrong. What Paul <laughs> says, <laughs> it will feed into improving your book, and it'll be this strange circuit. And everyone, and everyone will say, yeah, Paul Bowman was lecturing about that like two years before Daniel published it. Daniel Mraz nicked all of his best ideas. I from nicked all of it, all of it, all of it. I'm glad we're recording this. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I still, I, you know, I, there were sort of two points of view that uh, that came out, this is, I really am concluding, um, out of this, uh, you know, how do we look at things that have been the presentation has been modified you know are we very strict uh relativists anthropologically speaking or is there some kind of uh you know larger thing that uh might be universal and uh the this is uh Hanegraaff who brought this up he said well you know there's sort of the hermeneutics of suspicion of Paul Ricoeur and the recollection of meaning of Mercea Aleade and those two things are kind of in the, especially just that, like 60s, 70s, those are really crashing into each other and uh, and sort of the hermeneutics of suspicion is one. <laughs> and uh, I feel like it's incomplete to simply run around, you know, debunking things like, hey, Reiki was invented by some dude in Baltimore. Like that is really funny, but there's probably more to it when we start to look at all the examples and so the thing the challenge i have with writing about it is how to not make you know how to not do myself out of a job because if you debunk everything that's interesting mm. like what are you gonna have left to talk about <laughs> right so i'm you know i'm being very uh, humorous and pragmatic about it i don't want to do myself out of a job uh by reducing the phenomenology of whether it's reasonable to talk about it's almost like you you're you deep you're not so much debunking actual stuff you're, you're you're reconfiguring it and re-accenting it in a in a so you know you're, you're debunking source amnesia and your you know and, and fantasy and simplification I mean, when i used to teach tai chi i would and you know you get like you know you get like middle-aged and old women and old men coming like what well, is this ancient chinese thing and it's thousands of years and it's like well it's kind of not you know, it's 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 had so many reconfig, and I would tell them what I knew of like you know, twentieth century reconfigurations of Tai Chi, and they'd go, "Oh, that's great. Okay, I'll see, I'll see you next week. Bye." And they were fine with that. They didn't need it to be thousands of years old and unchanging. They were like, "Well, it feels really good, and I'm more mobile now." And so yeah, I, I agree, but I, I have no problem with debunking. Um, if something is great, you don't need to have a bullshit history about it. Do you? you can have a real one that might only be a hundred years, as opposed to like fifteen hundred years or something. I also feel like the the what we might say is the real histories are very often a lot more interesting. Yeah, they're harder to explain quickly. They're convoluted, but I think it's absolutely fascinating that you know something that was you know essentially designed for profit in baltimore got used for the creation of art theater in moscow that's amazing like yeah. whatever the example is the real history is or the the more detailed history is really really engaging and uh that's a profound yeah. profound point to end on <laughs> that's gonna people are gonna go and go wow that really and my students will be like wow paul that was an amazing interview you did with daniel what a great guy. Let's go to Canada. <laughs> Hang out with him. We have to know. He knows the truth. Um, he knows the truth. You, know he knows the, truth. The, tr the truth is it's really cold and we have snow <laughs> um, as of yesterday. We used to get snow, but anyway, I'll tell you what, I'm going to, um, I'm going to stop recording. Okay. And then we can chat. So thanks. Thank you for um, educating me further. 
ongoing education. <laughs> Thank yeah, you, Daniel. Yeah, um, Daniel Moraz, I'm going to press You're on. very welcome. <laughs>